Hi, everybody. I'm Marianne McGee with Reynolds Community College, and I'm dishing with Paula. That would be President Paula Pando, the president of Reynolds Community College. And you know what? I'm, I'm not just talking with Paula. It's dishing with Paula for a special reason, because there is food involved, specifically a dish that Dr. Pando has made just for this show. And so she's going to talk about that dish. We're going to talk about food in the college and a number of other things. But the first thing I have to do, Dr. Pando, I, I, I have to know the answer to this question because I happen to know that you get up early in the morning and work, you stay up late at night at work, you're hard at work on the weekends, yet you really find time to cook. And I make, I mean like homemade yummy dishes. So tell us how and how and why you do this. Well, thanks, Marianne. I'm really excited to be here. This is going to be so much fun. Um, I think everyone needs to have things outside of their workplace that they love to do. That just things that bring them joy. Um, and for me, there's nothing more joyful than being in my kitchen and creating something for people I love. It's how I grew up watching my mom cook uh, and always being at her side. And um, what is she putting in there? No measuring cups, no measuring spoons, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, the wooden spoon in the mouth. And yeah, it went right back into the pot. Like there was no, so, uh, so it's, it's, it's just, it's always been a joyful part of my life. Uh, it's, it's part of our family life. And so uh, you find the time for the things that you love. And the weekends are really when I get to spend hours um, um, putting things together that I love and I know my family loves. So I just make the time because I love it so much. Well, we kind of live a little bit vicariously through your cooking. I do because I occasionally I'll get to hear about a dish you've made and it looks and it's, it sounds wonderful. And you you prepared some dishes for us as college president. You've done a couple of demonstrations and we're going to get to one of those. Now, I am I am generally not sitting in the intersection of 25th and Nine Mile Road, <laughs> but I'm here for a special reason because the kitchens at Reynolds is behind me, a beautiful, incredible facility for culinary arts instruction but not just culinary arts instruction really it's a doorway to the community uh, for all of our college programs really exciting normally we would be there and one of these days we're going to get to see you and other people other guest chefs in that fantastic space we have just for demonstrations it's wonderful and you were there dr pando not too long ago with governor northam and he had some interesting news to share about g3 this is going to be and hopefully it's passed that we had this funding for um, instruction in high demand areas free instruction in high demand areas it's an interesting idea let's spend a moment or two talking about that and then we're going to get into your dish but the g3 news was great. Yes, absolutely game-changing. Game-changing for the Commonwealth. And think about the environment that we're living in today. Very divided politically. And yet G3 has enjoyed almost universal bipartisan support. And it's a $35 million investment in tuition-free community college in high demand programs, as you mentioned. And they're in five fields, healthcare, IT, skilled trades, public safety, and early childhood education. And when you think about the many barriers that so many people face, especially now in the age of COVID, uh, so many barriers to be able to pursue uh, a higher education, a credential, a certification, one of the biggest barriers is financial. It's certainly not the only one, but it's a doozy of a barrier. And to think about that barrier removed, removed completely to uh, be able to study and get credentialed in a program where there is a job at the other end of that credential. And in most of these programs, these are jobs that pay a really good wage. So really exciting. We're hoping fingers and toes crossed that it passes with the same support it's had all along the way on um, that July 1 G3 becomes the law of the land in Virginia. Mm, I hope so too. We will be just 
thoughtful and prayerful about that because that was truly really a blessing. Now, I want to get to the kind of cut to the chitlins and I want to get to, you have to forgive my saying cut to the chitlins. That was the saying we used growing up. But let's talk a little bit about your dish, your recipe, Dr. P. What have you prepared for us today? Talk a little bit about that. Okay, so one of the best, best gifts I have ever received was this book, Martita's Cocina. Martita is my mother. It's the nickname for Marta, Martita. Cocina is kitchen. And my beautiful sister-in-law, Sandy, watched her for a year and meticulously wrote down everything that she did and secretly photographed her. So all of the Creole Chilean recipes that my mom made are in this book. And so what I've made uh, is a, a dish called Brazo de Reina, which means queen's arm. Funny, but Chileans, we kind of funny that way. Uh, queen's arm. And uh, it, it was a dessert that my mom made. Again, uh, these are the kinds of things like, ooh, I wonder if mom will make brazo de reina. The same way, you know, my kids are like, is she making chocolate chip cookies? I was hoping for this. So uh, in honor of my mom uh, and uh, to try a little baking, uh, which is outside of my comfort zone, but something I do occasionally, um, that's what I've made for you today. Well, this looks, I mean, I, I, I can't wait to um, hear a little bit about how you put all of this together because you, you told me a little bit about this and it just sounds delicious. And what are the kind of the main steps for putting together the dish? So the main steps are patience and making sure that everything is in order, in exactly a precise order, but really simple ingredients where you don't have to go fancy. Um, one of the uh, signatures of Chilean cooking is whatever's in the fridge, you can make something out of it. And so it's eggs, it's sugar, it's flour, um, uh, a special ingredient um, called manjar, what is manjar? Manjar is actually what we call here in the States, another Spanish word called dulce de leche. haagen made an ice cream that was off the shelves all the time, which was vanilla ice cream with a swirl of dulce de leche. It's kind of like caramel, but not really. Fresh whipped cream, walnuts, that's it but prepared in a very specific order so that the dough is fluffy and doesn't break and that the layers of sweet and salty are perfectly calibrated so uh, it's not a hard dish but you gotta follow the steps so for us freewheeling like throw a little more of this and throw a little more of that that's where the outside of the comfort zone it's like okay paula patience you have to do it this way in this order for this amount of time Wonderful. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a there's a part where you have to let you prepare the dough. Do you let it rest? Do you put it in the fridge? There's a, a part of this where you have to make the dough and then revisit it. Tell me, a, tell us a little bit about that step. Sure. So you'll see uh, we um, when we make the dough, we actually uh, uh, put it in a cookie sheet with parchment paper. Super important. That is like the superhero parchment paper on this. Um, and when it's out of the oven, it's only 15 minutes in the oven. Uh, when it's out and you're peeling the paper back, you wanna make sure that you can work with it, that it's not too hot. Once you roll it up, you want it to keep its shape, right? There's a lot of stuff in this roll. And so you, you tighten it up with a lot of the wax paper, parchment paper, whatever you're using. You put it in the fridge for 30 minutes so that it sets in that roll. And then you get to take it out and go to town. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. And so, and the going to town makes it look particularly beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then you, and but, but the, but the star of the show is obviously what's in the queen's arm. Uh, so <laughs> let's take a second. And if you wouldn't mind, would you mind cutting in to the dish and talking a little bit about what is inside? What is making it particularly tasty inside? Okay. All right. We'll do. Well, I have to tell you, I feel like I'm tasting sugar because one of the things we finish it is with powdered sugar and powdered sugar kind of gets everywhere. So as I'm talking to you, I'm actually tasting some sweet stuff. So let me, in my very low tech way, <laughs> show you, uh, here she is, all right? Now I'm gonna cut in the middle of it so you can actually see what's inside. And 
it's a kind of a big knife for such a soft let's see and we're going to do this cutting a slice from the middle because the middle's always the best part ah Mmm. The cream so in the middle. Inside this mm. incredibly fluffy dough that, believe it or not, only has two and a half tablespoons of flour. Two and a half tablespoons of flour for this huge roll uh, because the majority of this is the egg white. The egg white fluffed and so forth makes this really fluffy dough. But inside is that manjar, that dulce de leche, as it's called here um, in the States chopped walnuts, and then freshly made whipped cream, which is truly half a cup of uh, heavy cream, two tablespoons of sugar, and you beat that for whipped cream, and you'll see it's layer and, la and patience, something I'm not known for. Lots of patience, making sure it's, and then rolling it up uh, to something that, I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. And it's not because I made it. This is mom's recipe. I followed it to the T, and that's why it's so good. Do you have it generally warm, room temperature, out of the fridge? How can you, what's the best way to serve it? What's your favorite way? So so the 30 minutes is really for it to set. So it doesn't really get very cold. Uh, I personally like it room temperature. Now, there are some folks who really, they, they get crazy with this. Like, I just put a little powdered sugar because there is so much sweet stuff. There are people who put chocolate over it or another layer of whipped cream or another layer of the manjar. I'm like, there's enough sweet stuff here. Uh, this is the way I like it. At room temperature, sliced and uh, plated with the key ingredient that my mom puts in every dish. And it's right in her intro in the cookbook, which says the main ingredient is love. The main ingredient is love. And that's what cooking is for me. You have shared so much about your experience and your family immigrating here. And I, and I think about all of the fantastic diversity we have at Reynolds. I mean, we have students from all over the world, but the idea about how food anchors us, those kind of cultural food memories and experiences, what are some of those for you? Do you remember having to adjust to different food when you got here? Was your mom someone who still liked to cook Chilean dishes and Americanized dishes? What was your food experience like as a kid? So we never, ever went out to eat, <laughs> ever. Never, 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 never. It was always my mom beginning early in the day. My mom was at home uh, for much of our childhood. And I remember my brother, Frank and I, uh, I have two brothers. Frank is my partner in crime. He's like my twin, only a year younger than I am. And my baby brother, Danny, is almost 15 years younger. So there's pre-Danny years, which we call the immigrant years, and the post-Danny years, which are the Americanized Marta and Pancho. So Danny had the chicken nuggets. Danny had pizza night. Danny had microwave popcorn. Frank and I had none of this. We had porotos, we had arvejado, we had stuff that questionable whether garbanzos, <laughs> like all this kind of stuff. And my mom would be terribly put out when she put all of this effort into the cooking. And we would say, why can't we have pizza like the rest of the kids? Why can't we have, you know, and, uh, and my mother's like, in this house, I cook and it's better than anything you're gonna get out there. So for us, it was always Chilean food at home. And I'm talking dishes that took two to three hours to prepare. There was no like throwing a bowl of rice and you know putting a chicken breast on the grill and we're done. We were in apartments. We didn't have a grill, we didn't have a backyard. So uh, my mom took a lot of pride in her cooking because she didn't know how to cook when she got married to my dad and my dad was raised by the best cook in the world my grandmother and so she learned from my grandmother from my grandmother so a lot of the food was informed not just by chilean culture but where my grandmother was from andalusia spain and so there are a lot of it's kind of got two cultures very distinct somewhat similar but very distinct so that's all we knew uh, Again, we ordered out for the first time after Danny was born and probably like 10 or 11 years old. <laughs> you know, I, 
a, a lot of people watching it probably you remember the the big my big fat Greek wedding yes and uh, and Tula uh, you know who was always horrified at having to bring her Greek lunch to school and then yeah. growing up and sitting with the cool kids and she's having her little sandwich on white bread it was just like such a, a, a different idea about absolutely <laughs> did you, I mean, could you relate to that yeah I mean I would see kids with peanut butter and jelly on Wonder Bread. And I would say to my mom, I want that. Are you, oh, oh. I mean, she would actually look, you actually think I would put this in the body of my child? So we would have weird sandwiches compared to other kids. And they weren't healthier than the other kids. Like salami is not a healthy thing. But salami, I think it was not expensive. It was a staple. I was like the salami kid in school. It was always salami and it had to be a different kind of bread. Wonder Bread was like beneath my mom. It's like, what is this? It's fluffy air. It's not real bread. So we'd have this big crusty bread making noise. While we were having lunch and everyone else was eating their perfectly square peanut butter and jelly with the crusts cut off. I cannot imagine my mom cutting off the crust of my bread. And one so, of those yeah. sandwiches, that sandwich sounds so delicious. Salami on crusty bread right now. I mean, it just seems like it would be the most delicious thing in the world to eat. Oh, that is, it's so funny. I love kind of those experiences that, and, and particularly through the, through the eyes of a kid, um, their experiences growing up with food. I mean, there are just so many interesting ones that we, we can talk about. And you think about the, the how food and fellowship are so connected. And one of the, the you've talked about this in, in lots of different ways and different occasions, but you've talked about creating a sense of belonging at the college. So students, faculty, people feel like they belong. Uh, talk a little bit about what you mean when you're saying creating a sense of belonging um, and why you think that's important. You know, Marianne, when I think you and I are around the same age and uh, back in the 80s, there was this big push for this term called tolerance, right? That we, be, that we need to be more tolerant of people who aren't like us. And I remember for some reason just having and taking issue with that word. Because when I think if I go visit someone or meet someone for the first time and someone says, oh, they said you were, they, they tolerated. They tolerated you in their home. They tolerated your presence. It, it doesn't, it never felt right for me. Feeling in, that I belong, feeling wanted, feeling appreciated for all of my whatever eccentricity differences, um, that's, that's a different feeling. And I think a student, when they walk through uh, the doors of our college, for many of our students, they're the first in their family. And so they're already struggling with perhaps some self-doubt. Am I college material? Am I ready for this? Can I pay for this? Um, perhaps they're on their second or third chance in education and weren't successful before for a host of reasons. The encounters they have with us, students don't have encounters with institutions, they have encounters with people. And the people they interact with can either affirm their decision, we're so glad that you're here, how can we make this work, we're going to find the resources that you need, or they can perhaps confirm some things they might believe about themselves, uh, things that aren't true, but life maybe made them feel less confident about their ability. So I think belonging and students feeling when they walk that it's their college, it's their college too, and that their friendly face is greeting them and everyone is cheering them on, that we're on their side. So I just think that that's so important, especially for those of us, and I was certainly one of them, who you know, didn't have parents, I have the best parents in the world, I know everybody claims that, but I do. Uh, my parents didn't go to college. And so they couldn't prepare me for some of those things. And so when I started, I was afraid of everything. I don't know what a bursar is. What is a bursar? I've never heard that term in my, I understand pay here or cashier, but bursar, I didn't know. What is a dean? What's important? Why is it important to be on dean's list? All of those things. And so there were people along the way for me 
who are like, you are, you are a wonderful person. You belong here and you have something to contribute. And so I think that's important in all of our work, no matter what position you hold at the college, no matter the position, a security guard in a parking lot can make or break someone's day. And I, I say the retention of our students begins in that parking lot. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've actually told some very funny stories about, <laughs> uh, about just being that pioneer in the family and calling to announce that you were on the dean's list <laughs> and, and your parents saying, wait a, wait a minute, you've made a list? What's that about? I mean, who's, who's Dean? Who's Dean? Why are you on his list? <laughs> Coming from a country where being on a list meant you were going to be taken to a stadium and possibly jailed or shot. So right. lists were good. <laughs> It's a good list. Stay off the list. <laughs> well, I tell you, Dr. Pando, you have um, really outdone yourself with the Queen's arm. I am excited to try. I mean, you know what? I, I do a little baking here and there, but sometimes you have to have somebody give you a little confidence that, that, that you can give this a shot. And I love that we've been able to see you actually prepping this. Is it just, is it just so delicious? <laughs> Mommy. Mm. We are all sending Reynolds love to Marta oh. right now. I mean, we really are. She'd be, she would, mom in New Jersey, if you see this ever, you taught this young Padawan well. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Paula, it was so fun to dish with you. When we when we get to dish again, I want to I want to throw this out so you can be thinking of it. I'm going to ask you about some of your your desert island dishes. If you were on a desert island and you only had a few dishes to have with you, what would you be cooking? So let's cue that up for the next time we get together and dish with Paula. Until then, we want to wish everyone happy cooking. Stay safe and stay. Happy in the kitchen. If, that, if that's your happy place, stay happy in the kitchen. <laughs> Dr. P, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for sharing that recipe, your memories. And until the next time when we get to dish again, take care. Thank you.